Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Just checking that my voice is coming through okay at the back. Um, thanks for coming to listen to me this afternoon. What I want to talk to you about is empowering farmer-led action through catchment collectives. I've essentially separated my talk into two parts. So the beginning part, I talk about some of the tensions, or the tens multitude of tensions, I suppose, out there in New Zealand at the moment on our farming communities, which is, is incentivising farmers to come out from behind their farm gate and start to engage in conversations about what sustainable management looks like on their land and for their water environments, also for biodiversity and also for climate change. So at the beginning of the talk, I talk a little bit about the why, and at the end of the talk I talk about these catchment collectives, so a little bit about the how. Oh look, way, so good. So we heard um, from um, Annie this morning and also Nick, and they started to talk a little bit about international consumer demands and changing consumer demands around agriculture and the products that it's producing. So what we know is that consumers, both internationally and also domestically, are starting to take a good hard look at their food and where it comes from. And what they're starting to look for is um, credentials around the sustainability of that food, around animal health and well-being, um, around the environment, things like biodiversity and climate change, and about how safe that food is for them to consume. And what they're really looking for is a product that they can trace back, that has authenticity and honesty, and that is made with um, integrity. When we're thinking about some of the pressures on our farmers at the moment, it looks a little bit, and I'm stealing a, a, a quote from Kirsten Bryant, a shit, a shit train is coming at us. So it's multiple pressures, it's not just one. And a lot what we're hearing about in relation to the domestic environment is freshwater and the concerns about agriculture and its impact on freshwater environments. But we also know what's coming up is concerns around biodiversity. And in New Zealand, we have groups working on developing a national policy statement for biodiversity. So that is coming through the pipeline as well. As well as we're hearing concerns around climate change. And a lot when we think about climate change, we're thinking about just reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But what we really haven't started to contemplate is climate change adaption and what it means for our land landscapes, and in particular our agricultural landscapes going forward. We've also got international um, consumer demands on food. We've got concerns around animal health and well-being. We've got disruptive technologies coming through, like synthetic proteins and cellular proteins, just to name a few. Also, what we're seeing over the last couple of decades in particular is increasing media attention around agriculture and its impacts on freshwater in particular. Originally, this was seen to be a daring specific issue, and we had campaigns like the Dirty Daring campaign being launched. But essentially what's happened over the last five years is through the media we're seeing more pictures of agricultural land uses more broadly and its impacts on freshwater. Things like, I mean, some of these pictures will be um, close to you, uh, cows in the Ohau River in the Manawatu, uh, concerns around intensive winter grazing, those were feedlot uh, pictures taken over in the Hawke's Bay, and also what was called spray and prey, but which is heli cropping undertaken in areas like the Rangitiki on our uh, red meat sector farm, so sheep and beef operations. Uh, under a national government, we saw some increased science around looking at agriculture and the impacts on freshwater in particular. And there was a report released, pr produced by Sir Peter Gluckman, the chief scientist for the Prime Minister, um, who looked at the multiple pressures on freshwater, concluding that agriculture was a significant contributor. And in particular, we had issues in New Zealand of increasing nitrogen levels. So this is just starting to highlight some of the tensions that our farmers have been faced. And what's happening with media concerns and increasing public concerns around agriculture, it has now been picked up and reflected in changing regulatory frameworks, which is impacting on our farmers in the region. And some of them I'll talk about in a minute, and you would have seen it. Things like the Waikato River, um, Waikato uh, Canterbury is another one which springs to mind, and the Southland Plan going through its process at the moment. So today it very much appears that it's really important, it's not only important what you say about yourself, but it's increasingly important what other people say about you. So there's a whole public perception approach to farming that we also need to take. So we've also got a change in our government agenda as well. So we're under national government and now we've got a Labour Greens government that has come through. Um, someone can't see my notes really. Anyway, these are some quotes. I'm just going to pick that up because I can't remember the quotes off the top of my head. So these are some quotes from the Labour Greens aspirations or governments that we've seen in our meetings with them. 
So in particular, um, and some of these are concerning, so there's a legacy of environmental protection and restoration within the first term of this government. That's the legacy that they want to leave behind. They're intending on having three years. They're not quite sure if they're going to be getting six. There's social and political consensus in their opinion that New Zealand has reached peak cow, um, that climate change and biodiversity need to be urgently addressed. And there's understanding, while agriculture has taken significant steps to address its environmental impacts, that this has not actually resulted in meaningful change in relation to freshwater in particular, um, improvements in ecological health. And that the bottom line for this government is no further decline in freshwater environments. And so what does this mean for us when we've got um, increasing domestic pressure around agriculture, when we've got consumers starting to demand different things from the products that they're um, buying, and then we've got a different political climate in New Zealand as well? It often means different changes in regulation, and so that's a little bit what we're seeing at the moment. And so I just want to tend to spend a moment and take you through this diagram. It's applicable for policy in New Zealand, but also when I go to talk about catchment collectors in a minute, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a pathway, I suppose, for how you set up and implement a catchment management plan and the sort of aspects that that catchment management plan needs to look at and needs to address. So first, the conversation that we're having in New Zealand and also nationally is that we need to operate within our environmental limits or our environmental thresholds. In New Zealand, this is given teeth through the national policy statement. So what we're seeing coming through regional council and plans now is management approaches which establish numerical bottom lines. These bottom lines are set to provide for the values that communities have for fresh water. So these are just not the ecological values, but those also those community values. Things like the ability to recreate in fresh water, the amenity values that fresh water have, the cultural values that fresh water has. And so those more broader values, those more societal values, are increasing our environmental bottom lines that we need to manage through. Also within that, though, is an appreciation that agriculture is a vibrant and important part of New Zealand's culture, our society, and, and the um, economics which drive the country. So within that, there's a recognition that some of that resource, whether it's biodiversity or whether it's freshwater, needs to be available for use. So through these plans, we're getting allocation frameworks put forward as well. I'm very, I'm very quickly going to finish this section and go on to the catchment collectors, which provide us a, a pathway forward these numerous pressures. But in New Zealand, regional councils are really struggling with implementing the national policy statement. So those areas in red show where regional councils are changing or putting in place uh, second generational regional plans. These are regional plans which set numerical environmental bottom lines and require our farmers to manage their land to achieve them or work towards achieving them. So there's a huge amount of work out there for regional councils. So while we're seeing a lot of regulation coming into the front, what we're also hearing from regional councils is that they want to partner with communities that, have, that understand the issues and want to drive for solutions. So while there's a requirement for regional councils to give effect to national regulation, regional councils, are, we're finding, are also open to looking for farmer engagement and farmer-led solutions, because this problem is too big for just a regional council uh, or, or an individual to address on its own. It's going to take cumulative community action to actually get us ahead of the curve. You would have maybe, uh, some of you that were here for Ag Innovation last year might have heard from Richard Beetham, and Richard provided just a quick snapshot of what was happening in the Waikato region. And this is a prime example of what input-based type regulation looks like in the absence of anything else. And so through that regulation, we're seeing a, a drive to uh, change land, so go from pasture back to forestry. We're seeing stock regulation being put in place. We're seeing restrictions on the amount of nitrogen that can be discharged from the property being put in place. And the costs of imposing this type of framework are significant. So some of the costs that we're looking at is um, upfront capital costs of between 26000 to 541000 per farm. Ongoing annual costs are between 5000 to 70000 per farm and opportunity costs in relation to imposing nitrogen restrictions of about 75,000 to 256,000 per farm. And this doesn't take into account the implications in relation to these management frameworks on the value of the land that you're farming. So now let's talk about a little bit about turning some of these um, risks into opportunities. 
So what we know is that the government is looking for solutions to these really complex problems, and that regional councils are also opening to partnering with, uh, with communities in looking for solutions. So what we're seeing generally um, off the back of the changing regulation is this tension caused within our farming communities. Farmers are now stepping out from behind the farm gate. They're stepping forward to look for solutions that suit themselves. So they're wanting to understand what the issues are and they're wanting to drive for catchment specific solutions that are not only deliver environmental outcomes but also deliver those other sustainability outcomes. Things like vibrant rural communities, um, recognition and protection of cultural values, uh, recognition and protection of their businesses as well going forward. One of the really empowering things about catchment communities is it's not just about farmers stepping forward and leading, so it's not about them making the table that they want to sit at and then deciding what's going to be in the menu rather than have that done to them. But it provides an avenue to reconnect rural with urban essentially, to reconnect with those other individuals and those organisations that have values within your catchments um, and that you normally fight with across the court table, actually in a really proactive space where you're sitting down together, you're understanding each other's values, you're understanding each other's aims and aspirations, and you're working together to look for those solutions, so bring everyone to the table uh, rather than, than having fractured communities. So catchment communities are really about building and sustaining a social licence to operate within New Zealand, that reconnection with the wider values that people have with our communities. It's about engaging in that conversation and bringing understanding uh, together in relation to the issues and the solutions. And also, more empower importantly, it's about empowering local solutions to local issues. So often we hear national conversations about the national issues, but really solutions lie within that local context. And within the local context, issues can be quite different. For example, some issues, some catchments might have an issue with sediment, some catchments might have an issue with nitrogen, some catchments might have beautiful water quality and maybe thinking about biodiversity and pest management, which is also coming through. So really through these approaches, you can target on what the catchment specific issues are and then what the catchment specific solutions are. And also when we're thinking about that global stage and being able to tell that unique New Zealand story on that global stage, engaging in catchment communities provides a credibility to that story. It gives another aspect of it where you can actually really talk about the product and how it's been farmed and how you're engaging with your communities on this journey. And this is not a new thing. So 2017, Beef and Lamb had a workshop um, looking at the environment and environmental issues. And as part of that workshop, we engaged with a whole lot of farmers and talked about if, they, if and where they were engaging in their communities in, the, in these community initiatives. Now, originally, we had sort of river care groups, and that's a form of, of a collaborative community initiative. But we've also got, across New Zealand, a whole lot of farmers working with the communities on biodiversity issues, on extending, extending predator-free, and then more recently looking at water quality and how communities can work together to resolve water quality issues. And shortly, I'll just give you a couple of case studies in relation to two catchment communities that have been pulled together to look specifically at water quality issues. So what does the roadmap to success look like? So firstly, it's about identifying what your specific issues are, if you have any. It's about getting together and having a chat about them, because often if you'll find if you're within your farm or your catchment and you're thinking about something, your neighbours might be sharing those concerns and that as well. So one of the first two steps is to identify what your concerns are and then to talk to people about them and see if they share those concerns. The next step is about forming a group. Uh, catchment communities have taken a whole lot of different approaches to this. A lot of them are extremely informal and they just to get together on a, on a regular basis to have a chat about things. Others have formalised those sort of group structure and maybe put some legal structure around that. The next part which is really important and which we probably don't talk enough about is that it's about also asking for help. So what we're finding when we're out there is there's a lot of organisations and expertise out there and they're wanting to engage farmers in these community conversations. There's organisations like um, Crown Research Organisations, universities, regional councils, uh, consultancy companies, Ravenstown's getting into the space, Balance is getting into the space as well. We've also got our industry leaders that are really getting into the space and thinking about how they can empower farmer-led catchment collectives to take ownership of the issues and 
and find solutions for their own future, which is not being given to them but which they're creating for themselves. It's about hatching a plan. It's about implementing that plan, of course. It's about reporting and monitoring progress, which I think is really important, and maybe something that we haven't done particularly well in the past, especially for the red meat sector. So it's about saying what you're doing, being able to demonstrate that um, through a plan, plan, through a farm environment plan, for example, and then through a catchment plan. And it's about being able to um, have those successes and then tell a story around those successes to the wider New Zealand public. And then often about these processes is that we're not expected to know everything up front and we're not expected to do everything perfectly. So when we're thinking about engaging in them, we need to have a process for evaluation and adaption. When you're thinking about like-minded people, it's really important um, that you look within your communities and you'll find other farmers in that that will share your concerns. But it's not just those individuals within, the, within your direct neighbourhood that have some of those answers to you as well. So, like I said um, before, the catchment community approach really provides an avenue where you can engage with a wider community. You can start to think about the marae or the school that you have within your catchment, um, those cultural values. You can start to think about some of the recreational values that you might have within your catchment as well. You can look for uh, industry leadership. Uh, Landcare Research also, or Landcare, sorry, Trust also um, has great resources that are available uh, to support and empower catchment communities. So when you're thinking about starting on this journey, remember you are not alone. There's a lot of people out there that want to be part of this journey and part of this story with you and that are there to empower empower you to be successful in what you're undertaking. One of the most important parts of having a catchment community is actually being able to document what you're doing, why you're doing it and how you're progressing. That's not to say that you're going to be held to it and it needs to be perfect, but having that journey road map, uh, journey mapped out is a really important part of being able to tell your story with credibil credibility and authenticity. And the first part of this is sort of similar to that picture I showed you about how regional councils are going on implementing the national policy statement. But it's really that first step is about understanding what your issues are. And I will take you to a picture in a second which, which starts to talk about that. It's establishing a vision, goals and objectives for your catchment and clearly articulating them. It's about identifying what actions you can take which will actually address the issues that you have identified, the priorities and the timeframes for undertaking them. It's also important uh, that you socialise your plan with a wider community. So you don't just talk about it within your small community, but you set it out there and talk about it on a broader scale with your regional council, with your district council, maybe through your schools, maybe through social media as well, which is getting a lot of hits now and a great way of telling your story through. It's about implementing your plan, it's about monitoring and reporting progress, what I which I talked about, and it's about evaluation and adaption in relation to what you're doing with that plan as well. So what we're seeing out there is one of the fundamental first steps that you need to undertake when you're thinking about a catchment collective is identifying what your issues are and what your values are. And so often I think we hear about the values for freshwater, like the fish that live in it, ecosystem, health and processes. But there's a huge amount of other values that we also think about. Recreation is one that gets um, that, that is quite commonly referred to and most of our freshwater have, have recreational values. But there's a whole lot of other values as well that are really legitimate to reflect not only in policy but in catchment plans and those are community values. It's, it's about farming families, it's about those farm and farming businesses, it's about the landscape that they're occurring in, it's about communities and having vibrant communities and sustainable communities and it's also about those economic values as well. So it's not just environment, it's, it's more holistic than that, it's about re representing those community values. The other value that we don't think about in relation to fresh water often is its ability to assimilate um, impact, so to speak. So making sure that it's resilient in the future to deal with things like climate change, um, to provide those resources that it provides to you now, now and into the future. And when you're stepping this through and, the first, and you're identifying your values, then it takes you to the next step of working out what's impacting on those values. So when you're thinking about develop managing, developing management plans, you need to know what you're targeting. 
And so this is a really important step, and it's often this step, I think, where that external expertise can come in and really help you to be focused. Because what we know is that sometimes there's people out there doing some really great stuff, but it might not necessarily be connected to the outcomes that they're trying to achieve, which means that it m might be excellent that they're doing these things, but it might not be best bang for buck in relation to outcome. And so when you're thinking about your values in relation to fresh water in particular, then you think then it's important to understand what the drivers are. So some of these drivers are wastewater treatment plants, it can be stormwater runoff, um, it's agricultural land uses. And we're thinking, when we're thinking in particular around agricultural land uses, then in particular for the red meat sector, it's the things that flow over the land. So things like sediment and phosphorus, um, fecal levels that can flow over and get into waterways, and then also things that go through the ground into the fresh water, which is things like nitrogen. So through the soil profile, into groundwater, recharging into surface water. Because when you go through this process of identifying your values and then looking at what the drivers are for those for impacts on those values in particular, then it becomes easier to put steps in place which, which get you in front, of, in front of those impacts. And when we're thinking about fresh water, we have a huge amount of resources within the toolkit that is available for individuals to pick up, and when they are picked up by catchment communities, lead to cost-effective solutions, far more um, impact than can be achieved on the indep independent scale. So what we know when we're looking at our landscapes is that when we're looking at the farm and we're thinking about critical source areas, about 80% of what we're losing is from about 20% of the farm. However, the real bang for buck is when you think about it at a catchment scale, often 80% of the things that are impacting on the water are actually being lost from 20% of the catchment. So while an individual might be able to do things like have a farm environment plan, identify critical sources on, the, on, their, on their farm and manage them, adopt good management practice, when you do it at the catchment scale, you can actually upscale it for bigger bang for buck. And you can start thinking about things like edge of field mitigation. For example, um, your real issue is sediment and the real bang for buck is putting a wetland in the bottom of your catchment or rehabilitating a wetland which is already at the bottom of your catchment. So what it means is that it really opens up the opportunity for you to think about other things that you can do in relation to a community action which will deliver those environmental outcomes while giving you the, the flexibility and the room to farm within your, within your environment. And in this space, we're really seeing some great tools being starting to be developed. A couple spring to mind. I think Mitigator is one um, that can be applied at the farm scale under development still. Um, Lucy is another one, which is sort of like a hydrological model, which means that you can, as a community, you can have a look at your catchment and have a look at the flow pathways in your catchment and then use that to inform where you want to put your mitigation at that catchment scale. But we have res, uh, regional councils and um, CRIs working on a lot of these at the moment, so there's more resources that can be brought to the table to inform these conversations. That's not to say that these resources tell you what to do and where to do it. They're just a decision support tool for farmers, so you can take ownership of what the issues are and then look for solutions that fit your particular catchment, so the right size, the right place, at the right time. The other thing, and I'll show you a couple of case studies in the moment that actually start to implement some of these steps that I've put in place, is understanding sort of what good management practice looks like. We're hearing a lot about that at the moment, but in particular for the red meat sector, I think when we're thinking about good management practice, I refer to it in relation to just some activities that we do that uh, might be a little bit more intensive. The two that, that spring to mind, and I showed you the pictures of them at the beginning so the public are concerned about these activities as well, is intensive winter grazing either the, on the flats or on the hill country. So we know that when you're doing these activities and you're applying some good management practice, those are the way that you graze your stock down, the separation that you have from your waterway, you can reduce your discharges by about 80 or 90 per cent. And so when you're really thinking about a catchment plan, you can also think about the things that individuals can do on their farm as well as those things that the catchment community can do to really start to address these issues as well. And it's important that both are built into a catchment plan it's really not just one or the other, but it's a mix of what works for your catchment, your farming businesses, your community. 
The other really important part is, is being able to document success. And so with both the Riri catchment that I'm going to show you now and the Pomahaka catchment, um, that's, after, that's the case study that I'm going to show you after that, they've essentially adopted a two-plan approach. They have individual farm environment plans for their farmers, and you'll be all aware of these. And then they have the catchment plan, which sits over top of it all and incorporates it, and which essentially informs what farmers should be doing through their farm environment plan. In relation to your consumers, then, in that world stage, if that's where we're going to get to, you essentially have two stories you can say. You've got your credentials, which are on the, behind the farm gate, um, where if they wanted to come and look at your stewardship and how you're proving that over time, then you've got that that you can demonstrate um, that to them with. And then with your catchment plan, it sort of incorporates those larger values and shows that custodianship across not only just your farm, but an entire catchment area. Great. Two quick um, case studies. So Riri, um, so this is the Riri group is a group of farmers that are based in the Gisborne area. Um, they call them the Forokopai. It's part of the Forokopai Water Quality Improvement Project. And so this group of farmers got together because there was really a strong uh, community concerns around the water quality at the Riri Falls, which is a primary tourist destination in Gisborne, and which has a whole lot of cultural values as well as social values um, for that community. The, the, the pathogen levels in that waterway are really high and can actually impact um, human health uh, during those swimming periods of the year. So the community got together and decided that together they wanted to do something about that. It was a resource that they highly valued and they wanted to be part of the solution, not just part of the problem, which was what they were sort of being documented as being. And this is one of our most leading case studies that we've got essentially of how effective these community catchments can be. So this community was supported by, um, by Beef and Lamb and other industry leaders and was also supported by the Regional Council and supported by the Ministry for the Environment as well. They brought this community together. They provided them some science to understand the relationships between agriculture and water quality and they enabled these farmers to work together to build farm environment plans which on a per property basis started to look at some of those critical source areas and started to look at those areas where they could manage them to reduce the risk of um, overland flow um, into their waterways. This is now in its like third year as well and it's um, going, going great guns. They've now got substantial money from MFE who's taking a, a close um, sort of support role in relation to this community. Uh, those farm environment plans now have been rolled out, not just within the Riri community, which was sort of at the headwaters of that catchment, but down the entire catchment. So they're wanting to actually upscale for impact across the entire catchment, not just within the sub-catchment that they were working with them. The Pomaha Water Care Group is another one that I just wanted to quickly touch on. This is in Otago in the South Island. And it sort of brings to bear, you know, this tension that's caused by regulation and what happens when farmers, rather than, um, you know, think about how they can empower themselves in this conversation rather than uh, being on the menu. What happened with the Pomahaka Water Care Group is that they've got issues within this catchment with, not, with nitrogen levels and also with pathogen levels. Um, the Regional Council put in a plan and what it has is numerical water quality outcomes which bite at 2020. If the farmers can't get ahead of the issues in that time period, then they're all going to have to apply for a resource consent after that. So that was a great incentive for these farmers to get together um, and develop their own catchment plan and start to develop farm environment plans which, when upscaled, start to bring uh, improved water quality back down to those numbers that have been set in the regional plan which will bite into the future. It's been funded through the Sustainable Farming Fund. Uh, it's supported well by Landcare Trust, which coordinates and provides advice. They've now got about um, 160 members, and that's 47% of the catchment, but the other catchment members are coming in as the time frames for implementing the plan and those limits um, start to look closer. They've got a committee of 10, so while they've got 160 members, the committee is quite small, but it represents farmers on every single one of those tributaries, so they've got like an overarching or a holistic view of what's happening within that catchment, uh, what land management practices are happening and where they're happening with, the, uh, with them as well. And this is just an example of the Pomahaka um, essentially care action group. So you'll see at the beginning that they've started off with their vision, which is really important. So our aim is for the Pomahaka River to be recognised as having absolute highest water quality um, that future generations can enjoy um, in the rivers that we have. 
They've got, identified their values, and so those are not only ecological values, but the societal values and economic values as well. And then they've clearly articulated their goals listed out there. And then what they're doing is they're also undertaking a large program of citizen science where they're monitoring water quality, they're monitoring what's happening on their farm, and they're able to see those relationships as well. And they use that as an education tool, but also as an adaption tool so that they can um, change their practices or their actions over time as they need to to achieve those goals. So in summary, um, domestic regulation is not going away anytime soon. It's actually just going to be increasing. But it's important that we not only think about water quality, but we also think about our resources at large, things like climate change, climate change adaption, um, biodiversity, um, the well-being of our societies, of having vibrant rural communities moving forward. Councils are frantically trying to implement this national regulation and they're looking for farmer leadership in this space. Where we have farmers engaged in catchment collectives, you're likely to have a, a, um, a, a more hands-off approach to regulation. We're thinking that it'll be wrap round rather than enforcement. This is a really challenging environment to be in. Um, but if we understand the pressures and we work together to look at solutions, then I think it's also a really empowering environment to be in. And it's not something that we need to be scared of, but that I think in the future will provide us with even greater opportunities. Working together in our communities, building relationships, scaling action for impact, provides a pathway which empowers farmers and our communities in this, joy, in this journey so we can have sustainable resources, a story to tell that's got transparency and honesty, and in the future, um, ongoing vibrant rural communities and a social licence to operate. Thanks. So Kirsten's quote was, we've got a a shit train heading towards us. So, and it feels like we're fighting a bit of a rear guard action here. You know, we're just catching up with all of this shit. So once, excuse my language, once we get our shit sorted, and if we can do this, and if we can do it really, really well, you know, what's, we can, we can, we can fit into uh, what Nick Beebe talked about, you know, our, our story brand, but where does that position us? If we get our shit sorted, where are we positioned in, in the world? I think, I think firstly, um, you know, the direct impact that we're having, that's, happening, that's happening on farmers at the moment is not, it's our markets, international markets, but really what's biting us now is that domestic licence, social licence. So if we can engage in this, um, mend that rural sort of urban divide, um, tell some really good stories around what we're doing, it's going to really improve that social licence. And what that does is it gives us the flexibility to deal with impacts and pressures coming forward from our markets. It essentially provides us breathing space to get our ship even um, further together and to be able to adapt um, to address you know, changing consumer demands and changing markets. So I, th I think it's really important in relation to building um, resilience around our communities. And the other thing that we're not really talking about is climate change adaption. And I've seen some climate change scenarios for um, different parts of, of the country. I'm particularly thinking Wairarapa. Anyone from the Wairarapa here? Maybe I won't talk about the Wairarapa. Anyway, so, um, you know, and the, they're predicting some pretty dry areas. And so if we're working together with communities, it also gives us an opportunity to um, move land, to have the flexibility to, to decide what we want to do with our farming business going forward, given different climatic constraints as well. So I think it is really, because at the moment regulation's making it really hard to have flexibility and the ability to adapt. By taking these approaches, you're giving yourselves room to have flexibility to adapt to any sort of impact, whether that's climate change or whether that's changes in markets. This is a basic question, but I, I wonder if you could just define catchments. In, in that, I was at Waiheke the other day, and there was a, a little catchment of Aucklanders, and, uh, and at the most pristine beach I've ever seen, there was a big sign with a no-go and a kid's playground, and you can't swim there. And, and we live in a catchment that um, goes for a little way, and there's no schools on it, and, and no community. So... Yeah, no, that's a really great call. What I'm finding is that farmers are defining what their catchment is for themselves. And um, I'll talk about that in two steps, right? So there's the social aspect of it. And you really want to have a catchment group where you can engage with those people within your catchment and make 
um, those calls about what you're doing and where you're doing it. But you also need to be cognizant that if we're thinking about a river landscape, people will think they're part of your catchment even if they don't live in your catchment. So just if you're doing like a, I call that a sub-catchment plan or a catchment plan, you also need to be cognizant of the other people that are downstream from you um, or, or are slightly outside that also um, have a concern about what's happening within your catchment. And so that's why I think it's really important not only to talk to your neighbours and your, uh, your community about what's going on, but to actually try and socialise that a little bit wider and look for some wider impact as well. Because when you get all people at the table, you're less likely to have people throwing rocks at you from the outside. So I think really firstly it's about, uh, it's better to do something than nothing. It's about farmers wanting to do work where they're comfortable doing work, so engaging with the people that they're comfortable engaging with. And then once you've got that set up, then it's being also cognizant that things might go somewhere else and other people might be, want to be involved in that conversation as well. So having sort of an open door policy, I think. Thank you. Um, Karina, I just wondered if um, you had any examples of, of a group where they've had to get down to some uncomfortable decisions or as you know, they've, they've sort of made comfortable ones while they've been all getting to know each other. There's got to be some discomfort coming. Is, have you got any examples yet or is that still to unfold? I, I thought my whole talk was about uncomfortable conversations. <laughs> I was feeling uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the, I think what I'm finding is that communities that don't have direct um, retro pressure going on them right now, it feels to me like they have more room to really um, be innovative and think outside the square. So it's sort of like them being able to sit in one region and see that there's regulation coming in another region. There's enough tension for them to go, right, well, we want to be masters of our own destiny. Um, no one's telling us what to do right now. We've got all this space to be really creative with what we think we can do and to actually engage with a wider community. What I'm finding is when the tension becomes too much, Waikato springs to mind. Um, those, you know, that, that sort of free thought, the ability to be creative, the ability to think that you've got time and space to really engage goes away, and all of a sudden you get into a bit of siege mentality. And in those situations, it's really hard to actually have hard conversations because the realism and the reality of those hard conversations is going to bite tomorrow. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit of both. And so I think if you're thinking about catchment communities or getting involved, but you're like, well, we don't, you know, we've got, you know, we don't really need to do that now. What I'd say to you is. Do do it while you've got the time to think and plan and, and be masters of your own destiny. Don't wait till uh, you know regulation's sitting there and it's going to hit you in five years' time, and then think that you've got the time and space to really engage in that conversation because it does become much harder when those tensions are more prominent and the implications become very, very real. It becomes harder to step back from the conversation and be able to look at other people's points of view because all of a sudden you're just trying to protect yours. Thank you very much, Karina. Very enlightening talk. I know within our own area there's been a, a, a large amount of individual action, but there's certainly room for more group action, so that's Great. a key thing. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.